Okay, welcome everybody um, to the Agri SA and Farmers Weekly webinar on the minimum wage for farm workers asking um, can farmers afford this? Um, it's just past half past two, so I, I'm going to start now and then the rest of the attendees who registered can just join as and when they see fit. Um, I'm just quickly going to run you through the, um, the program for the next, the next hour and a bit. Um, our speakers today is we've got Christopher Nereda, who's the Executive Director of AgriSA. Um, we've also got Lebohang Setusha, she's from the Labour and Development Centre of Excellence at AgriSA. Um, our agricultural economist, Dr. Kurs Kutsia, he's also a columnist for Farmers Weekly. And then we've got Richard Nicholson, who's the Economic Research Manager at South African Cane Growers Association. Um, I'm just going to start with a brief introdu introduction, and from there we will move over to Christu Panarieta, who's going to talk about, um, basically give an overview of the minimum wage process. Um, Lebu Khang will talk about the process for applying for exemption, and then Dr. Kutsia will give a short presentation on the farm profitability squeeze, and looking at the affordability aspects of the minimum wage, and then we'll go over to Richard, who's just going to give an industry perspective. Um, we'll finish up with a panel discussion and a Q&A. Um, please write your questions in the chat section, and then we will deal with them during the panel session, or if there is time after the individual speakers, we can deal with one or two questions then. But, um, but mostly we will deal with them during the panel discussion, which will be roughly at about quarter, quarter to four. And then just as a bit of background and also to say thank you. So I think it was about last week this time that I quickly emailed Chris to and said, I think we really need to do a, a webinar about the minimum wage issue just because there's so much, so many questions and so much uncertainty that we certainly picked up amongst our readers about how the process that was followed to come to the de decision that was taken now by the Minister of Labor to increase the farm worker minimum wage by 16%. So I just want to thank Chris too and Aloise, Tia and John Ray, all at Agri's A, um, who, who helped us to organize this webinar in, an, in what was really a very, very short space of time. And just briefly as an introduction to the issues that we will be discussing today. Um, so on 1 March, the new form of minimum wage of 21 Rand 69 will come into effect. Um, this is the largest increase percentage-wise that we've seen since 2013, when the minimum wage was increased by 51%. And if we look over the last 10 years from 2012 to 2021, farm worker minimum wages has increased 181%. Back in 2013, when um, Mildred Oliphant was the Minister of Labour, the decision to increase the minimum wage at that time by, by roughly 50% um, was based on a study by the Bureau of Food and Agricultural Policy, which um, was then done under the leadership of the now director of BFAB, Doc, um, Professor Fadi Mayer. And back then the study found that um, a wage of 104 Rand per day, which was essentially what was granted by the Labour Minister then, um, would, would be unaffordable for most typical farmers in South Africa. And at the same time, this 104 Rand per day increase, which was lower than the 150 Rand that the workers had been asking for, would also not make it, not make far, farm workers able to afford a daily balanced diet for their families. So, so really on the one hand, too expensive for farmers, while on the other hand, not assuring a living wage for farm workers. And, and now 10 years later, we still find ourselves in exactly that same position. Um, where again, with the 16% increase, again, we are seeing farm organizations, farmers saying, this is simply unaffordable, especially in this year when there's going to be a double digit, digit increase in the cost of electricity as well. And again, as we saw 10 years ago, still, even at this rate, if we look at the, twin, the cost for the BFAP thrifty healthy food basket in 2020, 
Um, so to feed a family of four for a month would cost about 2,675 rand. To afford that basic food basket would cost a farm worker at the new wage rate, about 65% of his or her entire wage, which leaves very little to spend on other essentials, such as school fees and clothing, housing, electricity. So the same problems are still around. And it seems as if, at least from government side, we're still trying to solve these problems with, um, with a solution that just ends up creating more and bigger problems. Um, just this, uh, another increase in the minimum wage will, will not solve this. It will quite likely just result in even more job losses. And then on the point of job losses, um, to, it's, it's really difficult to measure the direct effect that a wage, a wage increase has on job losses in the farming sector. But if we just look at employment statistics in agriculture, according to Statistics South Africa, so from 2008 up to the last, up to um, the last quarter of 2020, roughly about four um, employment in the farming sector increased by roughly 14%. So there was a slight increase, even though there was those that big wage increase in 2013. However, if we um, compare this with the rate at which gross value production in the agriculture sector increased, and that was by 106% between 2008 and 2018, we can see that compared to growth that the sector has experienced, the growth in job losses, the, the growth in job creation lags very, very far behind which does suggest that farmers are finding cheaper, more efficient ways to get work done on the farm, which is, for example, through mechanization. But let's now get back to our speaker. So we're gonna to start today, as I said, with Christy van Herrera, the Executive Director of AgriSA. And I'm gonna hand over to you, Christy, um, to give us this overview of how this process for determining the new minimum wage has worked. Thank you very, very much. Um, I just want to um, share my presentation. It says here, host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, let me just try again. There you go. Okay, well, if you have a view of uh, this uh, presentation. Yes, there you go. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, Deneen, um, is my presentation visible to everyone? Yes. Okay. So uh, let me start um, and uh, perhaps uh, give some uh, overall background in terms of uh, the dilemma that we face uh, within agriculture. On the one hand, the argument is that farmers cannot afford it. On the other hand, farm workers uh, uh, struggle to uh, survive. And I think we need to find a holistic uh, solution for all of this. Now, our argument is the following. We say that we need at this point in time, get as many people as possible into a job. Our biggest, biggest challenge in South Africa is the fact that there's so, so many people unemployed. Let me continue with the following. And uh, this uh, is an extract from uh, the president's uh, sonar that he delivered the other day. He says the following. We have therefore decided to extend the period for the special COVID-19 grant of 350 by a further three months. Then he says that we've also extended the COVID-19 test benefit until 15th of March, 2021. The big question that we ask is what will happen after this extension? We've seen that the unemployment rate, according to the expanded definition, uh, has increased from 42% in quarter two to 43.1% in quarter three. And this is just the official statistics. A bigger, bigger concern for us, um, you know, as civil society and the business sector is that we've seen that the quarterly labor force uh, survey that was released by SSA 
2020 states that 11.1 million working age people are currently unemployed. And then according to SASA, there were 18.3 million social grants paid to 11.4 million beneficiaries in July 2020. So more and more unemployed people are becoming dependent on the state to help them to survive. Another big, big worry for us is that the overall number of companies that have been liquidated, according to data from Stats SA, increased to 20.5% in the fourth quarter of 2020. That in itself poses a huge challenge for uh, uh, people seeking employment. Most of the liquidations happen in the financing, insurance, real estate, business sectors, as well as the trade, catering, accommodation, and manufacturing sectors. The tourism industries have faced massive business closures, and uh, we predict that we will have even a bigger shedding of jobs going into the future. Now, in view of all of this, AgriSA is calling on government to free up the economy immediately. You cannot have a situation where on the one hand, government um, uh, tries to um, uh, provide people with all kinds of social interventions, but on the other hand, uh, those social interventions are not sustainable. We need to free up this economy. And how can we do that as a start? We need to relax the strict procedure requirements in the Labor Relations Act, Basic Conditions of Employment Act, Employment Equity Act, as well as the national minimum wage legislation. And um, my colleague uh, Le Bohang will at a later stage explain to you what do we mean by relaxing the strict procedural requirements in, in especially the national minimum wage legislation. Our argument is let us get as many people as possible into a job. That 350 rand intervention, as well as the other <clears throat> social interventions that are not sustainable. Unemployment at this point in time is the biggest driver of poverty. However, the state's ability to continue supporting the poorest of the poor with grants is not sustainable. Now, <clears throat> often people argue that farmers, AgriSA, we are against a, a decent wage for farmers or for farm workers. And I want to emphasize, we are absolutely committed to a social unity compact. And we have, uh, during our Congress in 2019, we have decided to adopt such a compact that will uh, bring about the following. Respect for human rights in farming communities. We need to have great opportunities for constructive dialogue between farmers and farm workers. Uh, we need to ensure there's compliance by AgriSA members with all legislation particularly labor legislation and land reform legislation. Promotion of compliance with best practices, in other words, sharing best practices, because you cannot have islands of wealth in a sea of poverty out there. And we've seen how increased unemployment, increased um, uh, social decay have led to a rise in crime and all kinds of other social ills. We need to make sure that there's constructive community involvement uh, in terms of addressing poverty, joblessness, and inequality. And yes, identify deficiencies that hinder progress towards social cohesion in rural areas. <clears throat> but more so, what are the enablers that can be put in place to bring about um, a, a social unity, but more so improve the living standards of people out there? Now we've done a, a desktop study um, and this is very interesting, <clears throat> especially the, the feedback that we've received. We've seen about 400 and 549 participants out of the 577. They've said that uh, the new increased national minimum wage will exceed, uh, exceed the allocated budget for wages in the 2021 financial year. In total, an amount of 1.7 billion the annual was allocated to wages in the year 2020, and they foresee a 24% increase in wage costs over turnover for 2021. That is just amongst this 577 participants. We've also seen that out of 456 of these participants, 
foresee retrenchments of their farm workers as a direct result of this increased national minimum wage. The data indicates there is the potential of 4,384 jobs to be lost amongst the 456 participants, meaning that 9.6 workers per participant run the risk of losing their jobs. Participants further indicated that the retrenchments will mostly impact seasonal or casual workers. Subsectors that remain labor intensive will consider mechanizing uh, processes that will reduce staff numbers and shorten working hours of retained workers. Some participants have alluded to reducing staff for a period of three months and halting job creating initiatives. And we've seen that, that within the uh, vegetable sector and general maintenance sector, uh, there's this notion of I either stop uh, uh, planting vegetables because I don't have the machines that will um, reduce my cost, or I will not do it at all because I cannot afford it. My input cost uh, doesn't justify the bit of profit that I intend to make. We've also asked our participants to indicate to us the level of poverty, hopelessness, and social decay in the areas due to large scale unemployment and um, need to indicate uh, whether there's high levels of despair amongst unemployed youth in need of employment. Now, we've seen that um, a scoring of one, uh, people says, no, there's not a, a large scale um, appearance of hopelessness and poverty, but the majority of our participants in all provinces have indicated they've uh, experiencing or they're witnessing high, high levels of poverty, hopelessness, and social decay. And remember, that is not because of, uh, as a result of what's happening within the agriculture sector, but this is the very interesting um, um, uh, feedback that we've received. Participants indicated that on average, four persons inquire for employment opportunities on farms, and this number is growing. Where do they come from? This is due to numerous people losing their employment in the tourism, and game industry. There's an indication of un high unemployment in the surrounding agricultural communities due to a lack of job opportunities. A bigger worry for us is, and uh, I trust that Dr. Kors will refer to this later on, we've seen uh, electricity tariffs, there's a 15% um, on the table in terms of increase, national minimum wage, a 16% increase, fuel prices have um, increased by 81 cents, Water tariffs have also increased. And then obviously, um, uh, yes, for diesel it's 59 cents, for petrol 81 cents. And then obviously the stronger and diminishing farmer income, especially where they have to buy, uh, where they have now to spend more money on buying uh, uh, input um, um, costs such as, uh, or input materials such as uh, fertilizers, diesel, et cetera. Now, obviously, you know, we cannot sit and just debate about the impact of this uh, increase and the impact it will have on uh, uh, job losses. AgriSA uh, continues to think about how do we bring solutions to the table. Now, what I want to emphasize this afternoon is that job creation and inclusive economic growth remain vital pillars towards achieving our objective in terms of improving the lives of all South Africans, especially those who are severely affected by poverty and inequality. Our point of view is that the national minimum wage will be rendered ineffective if there is not a holistic approach aimed at improving the lives of the most vulnerable households in society. There's a need for a very comprehensive rural development strategy, and that strategy cannot just rely on the agricultural sector to bring about jobs, to ensure food security, and uh, to play a role in terms of transformation. We need to look at a holistic uh, solution so that especially seasonal workers can benefit from a diverse pool of work opportunities and even uh, earn a better and more consistent income. In other words, the big question is, where's the housing programs by rural municipalities? Where's the plans to improve infrastructure of rural towns? Where's the plans to improve water and sewage provision, improving public transport in rural areas, improving quality education, 
making sure that there's incentives to add more value to what happens in the primary part of the agricultural value chain. And all of these things need to come to the table, put, be put on the table, so that at the end of the day, uh, you have a holistic rural development plan to improve the lives of rural people. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, this government cannot remain ignorant to the need of the poorest households, especially those who are unemployed. 11 million people are unemployed at this point in time. The alleviation of poverty does not solely rely on an increase in wages. It is aggravated by a lack of employment opportunities. In this regard, we believe everything must be done to free up the economy, remove policy constraints, create a conducive environment for businesses to operate profitably and create more jobs. This is the greatest need at this point in time. For the state to continue to provide all kinds of social interventions, uh, I'm not sure whether that will be sustainable. And we create a lot of expectation amongst the poorest of the poor that the state will be able to continue with that. We need a collaborative effort to bring all parties together, first and foremost, to make sure that we free up the economy, but secondly, that we have a holistic plan in terms of rural development and all of the other important uh, factors that needs to be addressed to bring about rural development that can create a, a greater pool of jobs out there. And these were the arguments that we have forwarded to the Minimum Wage Commission. It consists of I think uh, 12 people at this point in time. And as you all know, uh, from business side, our representatives have tried their utmost to argue and to put forth these arguments. But alas, um, uh, people have still decided to continue with uh, this uh, uh, massive increase. Now, we are not calling on government to freeze this increase. We are also not going to call on government to retract this increase because we cannot uh, allow a situation where this leads to uh, labor unrest, especially in the Western Cape, where people are now busy with harvesting. All that we say is that we must be very careful that this does not become a political football, right? At the expense of the poorest of the poor out there. We need to come to the table and plan together and decide together on what is the best way forward in terms of creating more jobs and creating more people into, um, or, or creating opportunities for more people and especially young people so that they can access jobs. This is our greatest need at this point in time. I want to thank you for the opportunity and I hope this will be a catalyst for further debate. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that, Christu. I, I just had one um, one question that I wanted some clarity on. So that you mentioned that the farmers that you um, that you polled said that they there were about four people applying for posts for jobs on farms. Is that is that in a month? Is that in a week? Just what's the time frame on that? That uh, is on a weekly basis, um, and obviously okay. we haven't determined uh, how regular it is. But given the fact that uh, many other sectors, especially your tourism sector, has come to an halt, uh, people are desperate. So they will knock on farms on their doors to uh, um, inquire whether there's a possibility for a job opportunity. Okay. Um, thanks, Chris. So we'll get back to some more general questions from the attendees at, um, after we've listened to all the presentations. So next up, we're going to listen to Lebuchang Setusha, as I said, from the Labor and Development Center of Excellence at AgriSA, who is going to talk more about um, the exemption process. Um, Lebuchang, would you um, do you have a presentation that you want would like to share? Yes, I do. Okay, so I'm going to just make you the host, and then you should be able to do that. Okay. There we go. Thanks. 
Okay. Thank you, Janine, and welcome to everyone that's joining us this afternoon. Again, my name is Lebohang Satusha, and I am from the Center of Excellence for Labor at AgriSA. So today I'll just be touching base quickly with regards to the exemption process uh, made uh, allowed in the National Minimum Wage Act in Section 15.1. So uh, with regards to the uh, exemption process, as I said, an employer may apply for the exemption process from paying the minimum wage on the national minimum wage exemption uh, uh, national minimum wage exemption system which is offered online on the website of the department of labor so with regards to the application uh, for exemption it is um uh, the system is designed to give you a response upon your uh, application whether your application has been rejected or your application has been successful However, if your application has is subjected to an audit review by the Department of Employment and Labor, then the outcome of the application must be received by your uh, by you as an employer within 30 days from the date of application. Uh, what is meant by an audit review is that what happens when you out, uh, upload a new, uh, your application on the system, the system is built to pick up triggers uh, from the financial statements uploaded. So basically, uh, if the system uh, if the system finds that there are discrepancies with regards to the reported revenue, to uh, discrepancies with regards to the total assets reported on your applications, audit triggers also can be discrepancies on the value of depreciation of the on your uh, on your assets. Uh, also, with regards to out of proportion when it comes to your net losses, then uh, discrepancies when it comes to your donations, your entertainment, your rise off, uh, the loss of assets in your business, then the system is built to pick all of that up and then your application will be subject to a review uh, process by the Department of Labor. So when we come to the next one, uh, when it comes to the consideration of your application, um, your application will be considered on two bases, uh, whether they can, uh, whether the employer can afford to pay the minimum wage and whether and if um, uh, before they apply, has there been a process of meaningful consultation between the employer and if there is a registered trade union within the workplace or if there's no trade union, the employer must uh, consult with the employees directly that they intend to apply for the for exemption, the reasons why they intend to apply for their exemption so that the employees or the representatives of the trade union know what's going on with regards to the um, with regards to the application and that they are aware that application is being made. When it comes to the determination of whether an, an employer can afford to pay uh, to pay the minimum wage, the assessment in terms of Section 15 is with regards to the affordability test uh, um, of the employer. So basically, this test looks at the profitability of your business the liquidity of your business, as well as the solvency of your business. Therefore, it is very imperative when an employer makes an application that they uh, supply the department with comprehensive financial statements of the business. With the application, it needs three years uh, financial statements, which includes the previous two years, which for in our context is going to be the 2019 and 2020, as well as your current year predictions, uh, or what we can say your current year budget that outlines that if you do pay the minimum wage for that year, how can it, they can see from your financial statements how it's going to affect the liquidity, the profitability, and the solvency of your business. So as I, I would like to reiterate again, it is important for employers to uh, submit those comprehensive financial, uh, financial statements. So when it comes to the second leg of the test, whether an employer um, is, um, lie, um, is um, eligible to have an exemption, consultation with your trade unions or consultation with your workers. It is important, first of all, that the employer, as I had reiterated uh, earlier, that uh, in the consulting, the employer needs to supply the, the a trade union or the workers with a copy of your application to be lodged on the national minimum wage system so that they can see actually where this application or the reason for application is coming from. When it comes to meaningful consultation and in the spirit of the uh, 
the Labor Relations Act. Meaningful consultation implies that the employer engaged in seeking and exchanging information, advice, opinions between themselves and the unions or the workers, meaning that the, the employer must show that they just did not just tell the workers or the union that they are applying for the exemption, but they sat down with the affected uh, uh, workers, talked them through the process, talked them through what's going on in the business and explained to them why at this point in time they cannot afford the minimum wage. So therefore it is important uh, when doing these consultations for an employer to keep a record of these consultations, as I as said, that it's an evidential process. Keep detailed minutes, keep the records of the meetings, keep any other evidence that will assist or illustrate to the department, or if um, your application would be subject to an audit, for instance, that can show the uh, department that you went, uh, the employer went to at great lengths to consult with the employees or the trade unions and that the process of consultation was fair and uh, uh, was fair and gave the workers or the trade unions an opportunity to address the employer and to discuss what's happening with regards to the exemption application. So as we continue, uh, continue with the considerations of the exemption application. The exemption application will require employers to provide information on their business. This, lit this list is not exhaustive, uh, but an example of what kind of information the system will require for you to, uh, to supply as an employer. For instance, your uh, employment equity insurance fund registration number, your compensation fund registration number, your SARS numbers, uh, or, uh, your business SARS numbers, the number of uh, workers in your, your in, uh, the number of workers that, that you have on your workplace in their entirety and their status, whether they're permanent, whether they're on a fixed term contract, whether they're seasonal workers, as well as the number of employers of workers to whom that the application will affect and they again their status. So um, as alluded to that, that you can apply for the entire workforce, you can apply for a certain amount of workforce, uh, and then you give them a list of the number of those employees who will be affected by the exemption if the exemption is successful. Furthermore, you do supply uh, the details of the number of months uh, for in case of seasonal workers that you contemplate they will work uh, on your farm for that year. And the full uh, wages, the full details of the current wages in respect of what are you paying them at the moment? Are you compliant with the minimum wage that is already in force? So therefore it is important for employers apart before to be eligible to make the, uh, to get the exemption. They must be compliant with the UIF. They must be compliant with the compensation fund. Uh, if there's a bargaining council agreement, they must be compliant within that industry. It is important that you are compliant in order to be eligible for the exemption. So therefore, if the application is granted, it is important to note to uh, employers to note that this um, you can only be exempt for 10% of the national minimum wage. So in our instances, if it um, it if it's uh, 20 at the moment it sits at 21 rand. Point sixty two. So, if you would, uh, your application would be successful with regards to getting the ten percent, it will be a nineteen rand fifty two. It will go to nineteen rand fifty two, which would uh, sit the employer, uh, the employee, or the worker at the same position if it was a one point. It was a CPI plus one point four, one point three uh, percent increase. So, um, it's, key, uh, it's important to keep in mind that you can only get a maximum of 10%. And furthermore, that this exemption is only valid from uh, for 12 months from the date of application. So, after 12 months, uh, the employer must, if they're still in dire straits, they must apply again. It's not forever. It needs to be, it's only valid for those 12 months. So with regards to um, when your application is successful, it is important that the, the uh, employer must know that the system will give them an exemption notice, which they must display free uh, around the workplace where it can be read by all employees. You, um, it's, and it's important that a copy must be provided to the relevant trade union within the workplace or upon every uh, request, if a worker requests a copy of that um, exemption notice, it is a legal requirement that you supply them with that. Um, in the case that your exemption notice is refused, the system will give you, uh, will publish on the National Minimum Wage Exchange System together uh, your refusal and together why the, um, your application was refused. 
So just to take note as well that the exemption notice is not ex uh, exemption notice can be withdrawn by the department, uh, and these are the reasons why it will be uh, it can be withdrawn by the department. So if they pick up that you um, it was granted to you, but later discover that you provided false information or incorrect information. If they discover that uh, you did not comply with the exemption notice, i.e. you did not uh, display it as requested. If the employees, if your financial position as an employer during that 12 months um, becomes better to the extent that you can start uh, affording to pay the national minimum wage, it will be withdrawn. But however, and then if there are any other justifiable reasons to withdraw the exemption notice, but it's important to know that before a withdrawal happens, you will be consulted as an employer. The uh, department will be in contact with you, find, tell you that they, uh, they, were, they saw A, B, and C, and that's why they're proposing for the withdrawal of the uh, exemption notice. So just to give an overview, this is a, just an overview of how the profitability test is uh, conducted with regards to, as we said, the profitability, they calculate um, the, uh, the liquidity, also they calculate the solvency. So all these systems fall within each other. So basically, um, if you pass, if you don't pass the um, the profitability, it can. Or if you do pass with a certain percentage, it moves on to the next test of liquidity. It or it moves on to the next test of solvency. Um, and this uh, is just an example of the exemption reports that department publishes every year. By law, they are required to to publish this uh, kind of report so that we can see as a general public who was given an exemption in what industry, um, how many employees did it affect, and uh, they will be publishing a new um exemption report at the end of the financial year of the department, which is the 1st of April 2020. Uh, thank you, Deneen. That's where my presentation will end for today. Devohan, thank you so much for that. Um, I've just I've quickly just put a question here. So what happens with, um, with farmers who who do not have these um, sort of full sets of financial statements and and it's someone who might have only been farming for two years and who's then, you know, at the start of the farming career, definitely not in a position um, to afford the full minimum wage, but wants to apply for exemption, um, but they don't have three years of records and no complete financial statements. Is there, can they still apply? At this point in time, when you look into the act, um, they cannot apply. But it's important for such employers to attend the local uh, Department of Employment and Labor mm -hmm. with regards to that, because that's what the same that's the same question that was raised at, um, at NetLag and during the negotiations of NetLag with regards to this um, exemption notice uh, process does exclude new businesses, does exclude the emerging to, uh, farmers, and uh, because of that, due to the three year of um, a three-year financial requirement. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was published as it was, even at the objections of um, the partners and representatives in NetLag. So it is a, a very uh, difficult and it's a very uh, big group of force and, and it hits hard on the small uh, farmers or the new farmers or the emerging farmers. So I would suggest at this point that they visit the dep uh, local Department of Employment and Labor, because in terms of the uh, system itself, it needs, uh, as it does, it's just an online system, it needs those three-year bank statements. Okay. All right, thanks so much for that, Liu Hang. I'm, I learned a lot from that. And um, we're gonna move on to Dr. Kuis Kutsia, who is an agricultural economist. He used to be the chief um, agricultural economist for the Milk Producers Organization. And he's also a regular columnist for Farmers Weekly. And um, Dr. Kutsia is just gonna talk a bit more about um, sort of farm pro profitability and what the situation is and what those factors are that really do affect farm profitability. Over to you, Dr. Kues. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you, Deneen. And, um, hello, everyone. Yeah, I think uh, Krista more or less, you and Krista actually more or less said all that uh, can be said about uh, wages and minimum wages. So, I'll just add on, I think as background, <clears throat> we talk about 800,000 plus workers in agriculture. 
and that number has been dec decreasing over time. Every year there are less farmers and farm workers, and uh, that's it. And um, wages are not in most sectors of agriculture the most important cost factor. Uh, totally, and one should be very, very careful for averages in agriculture, but on average, about 5,6% of farmers' direct costs is spent on, on um, uh, labor. But now, obviously, in your more intensive industries, it's much higher, and it can be up to 20%, I've seen. So, uh, averages are very difficult there. Uh, skilled workers, in general are not, or let me put it this way, farmers, the skilled workers of farmers are generally paid more than minimum wages. So in the, I know in the dairy industry, we had a, a strategic session a few years ago with farmers and the factor that scored the lowest on the, on the list of factors that impact on the business was minimum wages. So I asked why? because we don't pay, we have skilled workers, we don't pay minimum wages to them. So the minimum wage is actually for the temporary workers, seasonal workers, unskilled workers in the intensive industries. That's where the problem lies. Now, uh, just some economic background. I think we all know that our industries came through to very two or more very dry years. And uh, although it's rained more or less all over the country, there are still some pockets very dry. And those farmers really, um, uh, their cash flow is limited. Their cash income is limited. And also on that side, we have land banks crisis where we don't know whether they will have the money to spend to uh, lend to farmers. So farmers are just, just now out of a very bad period. Then uh, Christos mentioned the increase in, in input costs, 16% uh, for wages, 15% to 16% for electricity and a few others. Incidentally, interestingly, the exchange rate, that, that the strong rent that limits income actually is a benefit on the cost side, but uh, leaving that alone. I think we've seen the terms of trade in agriculture decreasing over time. That's a fact of life. And you can go to any industry, you can go to any country, you will find that the price the farmer gets for his products increases at a slower rate than the price he has to pay for inputs. That is fact of life. Now, to survive, a farmer has to become bigger and he also has to become better. He has to be more efficient. He has to use his inputs more efficiently. Now, what, when you talk about labor as an input, labor also obviously has a social and a legal aspect. I'll get to that later. But just taking labor as an economic input the cost of labor is compared to the cost of other, other input, input you can use. And uh, if labor, the price of labor increases, it gets more profitable to use other machine, um, other equipment, machinery. Uh, just a rough um, calculation at the Previous minimum wage, a farmer could probably spend 250,000 rand capital to replace one job. Now it's gone up to 280 and nearly 300,000. So you can spend 280,000 rand to get one labor, one worker less. It's, 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 well, your profit will be higher. So now it's very important. Uh, a few years ago, one of the journalists at Dairy Mail came to me and asked me, oh, Dr. Quisi, how can a farmer improve the profitability of his, of his workers? 
I said, you know, the sad fact is the only way you can increase labor profitability is to get more, uh, to employ less laborers and more capital. A simple example, one, one bloke with a spade, with uh, hand tools, can probably manage one hectare of land. Take that spade and whatever away, give him a tractor, he can, he can manage 500 hectares. So that means in that case, that tractor has, has uh, passed out or moved, moved jobs away from 500 people. So this is the important factor. Now, the larger farmers can afford equipment and machinery. And also, they, it's not in all industries, but a lot of industries are, can be highly mechanized. Problem is, we talk about the average farmer, and the average farmer is actually very small. There are only, and I guess this, the, unfortunately, Stats SA hasn't done that study again. I, I did it a few years ago. There are only about 5,000, 8,000 large farmers in the country. The rest are actually, if you look at the statistics, you find that the average South African farmer is actually small, small farmer. They cannot afford this. And this is where they get squeezed between increasing wage costs and the inability to mechanize, to get out of it in other ways. So that is just a problem, problems a statement. I agree with Christopher, the problem, big problem is not the minimum wage, but the big problem is the, the very strict and overregulated environment in which we uh, farmers have to operate. The problem is once you employ someone, you will have a lot of trouble one day when you want to get, get uh, retire him again. There's all this, all the regulations around it, all these consultations and stuff. You know, <clears throat> when farmers do that calculation on the cost of labor, uh, in the back of their minds is all the other problems with, uh, empl uh, with employment equity and, and, and Christo has listed a lot of the rules. So that is just my quick opinion from outside, and it's nice being outside, not being pride of the problem like Christopher is, but uh, I think in, in general, we will, and as you stated, as you stated, the problem is that, that even the current increased minimum wage is not really a, a enough for a family to live on. So that is the problem, but I think what we should do, as Christopher said, let's get more people into jobs by deregulating the, the, the environment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Katia, thank you very much for that. some very interesting um, observations. I just wanted to make sure that I understood this correctly. Um, you said about the sort of losing, sort of um, getting rid of one worker off of the payroll. So does that now, what you mean is so to to lay off one worker frees up two hundred and eighty thousand rand of capital for a farmer. No, no, no. The cost of one library per year is equal to the cost of servicing two hundred and fifty thousand capital okay. equipment. It's uh, it, it, it's it's the interest plus the depreciation plus mm -hmm. an estimate of repair costs on that uh, capital equipment. It's a, just a very broad one I'll, in my next article I'll do it in yeah. detail. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thanks very much for that. Um, but let's move on. Um, I'm going to go over to, to Richard Nicholson now, who's the Economic Research Manager at the South African Cane Growers Association. Um, the sugar industry in South Africa, of course, um, sort of just starting to emerge from what has been a very, very difficult time for, for sugarcane farmers, but we are now just starting to see sort of the first and very, um, very initial impacts of the sugar industry master plan. And Richard is going to give us a bit of um, insight from that specific industry about what the impact of this, this new minimum wage rate will be for producers. 
Richard, you yeah. have a presentation that you would like to share? Yes, please. Okay. You should be able to do that in a couple of seconds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you see it on your side? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for having me and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity from, uh, from Farmers Weekly for us as the, the sugar industry to, to join this um, this event, and I hope we can uh, be part of many more going into the future. So thank you, Deneen. Um, yeah, so we are the South African sugarcane uh, growers. We uh, represent the growers in the industry. Uh, the industry is a, a different one compared to the other agricultural industries in that we are um, uh, legalized with an act, the Sugar Act, which remained in place post the, the dairy regulation of the South African agricultural sector post 94 and the Kassir Commission. And this act allows us as the Cane Growers Association to represent the, 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 the sugar cane farmers in the industry when we, talk to, uh, when we talk to government and when we talk to the industry as a whole uh, with the millers and with the South African Sugar Association. So we represent the growers and those are our visions and our, and our missions as you can see there. And a lot of research and, and information is gathered to try and represent our, our farmers uh, in the industry. Just to give uh, everybody, all the uh, participants, a view of, of where we are and, and what we're up to and, and, and how many of us there are around. Um, you can see we're on the eastern seaboard of South Africa and the two most populous uh, uh, provinces, Mpumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal. And uh, the, the industry started off in KwaZulu-Natal back in the 1860s, but it now uh, spreads right up north to Malalan and Kamati Port in, in um, Kumalanga. And those are the northern irrigated areas where there's, lots of there's enough water to irrigate and there's beautiful heat units. And then there's uh, the dry land or rain fed areas in the KwaZulu-Natal. And you can see the 14 mills that operate uh, in the rural areas um, are, uh, in the sugar industry, those are all with the red dots there. So it's a, it's a wonderful industry that creates jobs in the rural areas. You can then see uh, on the left there that we have 20,700 uh, small scale growers. So uh, really much more small scale growers than large scale growers. There are only 126,000 uh, uh, large scale growers and they feed sugarcane to 14 mills. Unfortunately, this year, We've had notice of uh, Amzunkulu down in the south coast, which has actually been closed um, this year due to the industry downsizing. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll get more to that in, in a few minutes. But that's where we operate. Now, the contribution to the South African economy is, is, a, is a significant one. Um, uh, we, we, we have million uh, dependent rural livelihoods on the sugarcane uh, and the sugar sector as a whole. And the direct on-farm jobs currently is 65,000. And this is, this is uh, I joined the industry uh, seven years ago. When I joined, the direct on-farm jobs was 85,000 approximately. You can see that there's been a 24% decline even those years since I joined the industry to what we see now. Uh, you'll see there the indirect employment, so services sector to the industry, uh, the milling industry, along the value chain, there's an indirect employment of 350,000 people. The, the industry brings about 14 billion rands worth of revenue into those two provinces. Uh, and the annual sugar production is, is uh, around about 2.1 million tons of sugar. Uh, most of that actually is taken up in the local market. We call our local market demand, which is around 1.4 million tons this year. And the remainder has to be exported at very low prices on the export market. The annual cane production is, is around about 19.8 million tons of sugarcane. 
and why this this sector is so important for job creation and job uh, you know uh, holding on to jobs in in these rural areas is that it's a very hands-on uh, uh, crop it, it, all of our sugarcane or most of it is is cut by hand still to this day we we do not have the opportunity of of mechanizing as much as other industries have we currently have about 362,000 hectares of area under sugarcane. And this has also come down significantly, as you'll see in a graph I'm going to show you. You can see there our, our large scale growers make, they contribute the majority of the cane produced, 83.8%. And on an average farm size of 180 to about 200 hectares per farm. So when we look at average farm sizes in South Africa as a total, we actually operate on quite small farms. Um, but as you know, in the climate we have, it is, it is more productive. So you, you, can, you can get good tonnages off smaller areas. Our small scale growers contribute about 8.3% of the tonnage that is delivered to the mills. And then the millers, the miller farms, which surround some of the mills, um, only contribute about 7.9%. The small scale growers, their he hectares range between 0.1 and 25 hectares. So very much small areas in communal uh, land tenure systems that, that they farm on there. And, and the, they are a really important part to the sustainability of the industry, as well as job creation uh, and livelihoods in the rural areas. There's a few pictures there of, of our farming scenes. Um, on the left, you see the Midlands, uh, which is cooler areas that they can mechanize there. There's more, there's more flat land and there's, there's other crops like forestry. On the top right there, that's a commercial farmer with his oxen plowing land to actually plow the hills because we have lots of hills that we farm on. And, and the bottom, two, bottom left picture is the north coast, very hilly environment with other crops such as bananas, and, 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 but majority is sugarcane. And then the bottom is the irrigated north areas, very flat land which can be irrigated in Malalan Kamati Port. And then here's a picture of our a typical small scale farming setup with sugarcane around the homestead. As you can see, our, our total area um, under sugarcane has been declining for many years since 2005, this graph goes through. And this is work we do with BFAB. We have a very good relationship with the Bureau for Food and Agricultural Policy. I was lucky enough to be lectured by Dr. Fadi Mayer. And so we, we, we work really closely with them and we do this baseline with them. And you can see there that this is a declining industry, unfortunately, um, and it's due to a number of factors, uh, not only the minimum wage, but, but uh, uh, low world prices of sugar, uh, lowering demand due mm -hmm. to sugar taxes, et cetera. So you can see that we are a declining industry, but I think we'll get to a new equilibrium. Um, and you can see our sugar production uh, obviously works in line with the area and the area harvested there. What is interesting and what Dr. Kuas was, was mentioning, you know, the average uh, cost to grow uh, farmers around South Africa, due to the labor intensivity of, of sugarcane, we actually, um, our budget is around 30% of our farm costs go to farm stock. So, so uh, a, a very significant portion. And when I've done the, the calculations as to the increase of what the minimum wage will do, it'll push that up to 33 to 35% of the farm costs will go to, to, to farm staff now based on this increase in minimum wage. <clears throat> and that is a critical aspect for a farmer to try and absorb um, or try and work more efficiently and productively with the staff um, that, that they have available. You can see all the other costs there, fertilizer, fuels and lubricants and all those that make up the, the total costs of farming for sugarcane. <clears throat> then of the, of the labor costs, th these are the categories of staff that are employed on farms in, in the sugarcane sector. And you can see now um, there's a significant portion of them that are permanent, 27%. Uh, and then you have your 18% cutters and stackers and harvesting staff. And the permanent staff and the drivers are, are, are obviously more skilled and they, they, will, they will be remain on farm and they will be paid more, most likely at, the, at a higher than the minimum wage. It's the, it's the seasonal staff and other harvesting staff that, uh, that 
are create a problem for for the increase in the national minimum wage. Now, growers might not take on that many staff that they used to, um, and they'll have to try and make do with what they have available to them. And, and this is where it becomes difficult uh, to absorb the, the, the labor that they used to absorb for their operations. But definitely the skilled staff are, 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 what, are what drive the, the farming operation. Cutters, cutters and stackers, Another issue in the industry due to the, the non-availability of people willing to do these, this hard labor intensive work. And so farmers have to go far afield to find labor to, to, to actually uh, participate in these activities, which is also uh, uh, proving difficult. Then uh, Dr. Chris was talking about the farm squeeze. This is just a kind of example of, of that. Um, I have another one, but I didn't include it, but here you see the, the real total costs of farming in the sugarcane sector and the real revenue over time. And you can see we had a massive dip in the drought area uh, years of 2015, 16 and 2016, 17. And we've recovered nicely. But as you see, we recover in our revenue, but our costs just keep climbing in line with, in, in more or less in line with our revenue. So a, a return on capital or return on assets for the farmer is actually quite, quite slim. And it, and it makes the long-term sustainability of the industry, uh, it puts it definitely into question. You can see here again, these are just the major costs that you can see having been increasing over the years. The farm staff costs um, have increased and that is one of the reasons is coming out of the drought um, and, and utilizing more labor on farms to, to, to harvest and, and to manage all the cane that is available. But you can see that it is the major cost that influences a farmer's ability to operate. And so we're really concerned in the sugarcane sector that uh, with these real high above inflation increases that we actually won't be able to keep up. Then the baseline scenario that we ran with uh, BFAB, you can see the dotted line there shows that once with this increase of 16%, we're actually going to decline as an industry at a greater, a slightly greater rate going downhill rather than at the flatter rate, which is the solid blue line. So that is a massive concern for us uh, as an industry. And, 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 the, and the question now comes to, at what point do we actually start arresting this decline than, than actually uh, you know, continue on this downward cycle? So what is this impact at the growers as the employers? It's reduced profitability, ability, um, unable to make returns on capital. Uh, they turn to alternative crops, diversification, so, such as macadamias, avos, citrus, and forestry. Uh, there's much lower overall labor requirement per hectare for those diversified crops. Uh, you know, sugarcane is harvested from April to November every year, and that's a lot of people being employed for such a long period of time, unlike the fruit industries where large amounts of people are employed for short periods of time. So, so you know, uh, people can earn a decent livelihood and living off of working on the sugarcane farm for longer periods than they do necessarily in, in shorter harvest periods and other crops. And then the small scale growers, a massive concern for them because they utilize a lot of contractors in their areas. And obviously with contractors come labor and then their labor will need to be paid at the increased national minimum wage. And this will in turn cause the, their contracting costs to increase and therefore uh, make the small scale farmers and their operations unsustainable going into the future. Just on the jobs, I'm just going to focus on the bolded one there because I think we're running out of time. But due to our, our decrease uh, that we're looking at, we we see that our industry is probably going to uh, is projected to lose about 399 permanent jobs and 4,893 seasonal jobs that are currently currently under threat due to the the, the hectares that we're losing. But with this 16% increase uh, in minimum wage, you know, that adds another 1,796 permanent and 2,833 uh, seasonal jobs that could be lost. This is just projections, so it's not necessarily going to happen, but it, it, it's, it's, it's an economic projection. And, and this pushes our job losses uh, up significantly, and we're really concerned about this because we do, we do provide uh, livelihoods uh, to people in deep rural areas where they, otherwise there wouldn't be much to go, to go in, in terms of employment. And that's my, my short presentation. I thank you very much for your time and uh, for having me on, on this webinar.
Richard, thank you. For, thanks for that. I, I just want to ask one question about the mechanization in the sugarcane industry. Why, why, why can't um, South African sugarcane farmers mechanize to the same degree as sugarcane farmers in Brazil, for example? Is it just because the farm sizes are too small or is it a topography issue? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Great question. Um, Yes, it, it's it's a bit of both of those actually. Uh, farm sizes uh, are, are 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 generally a lot smaller. Although there's, there are drives in certain areas to create syndicates of mechanization where farmers can share the mechanize uh, the, the machinery. Um, but but topography plays a, a massive role, um, especially in the north coast. The cases in north coast, south coast um, areas where the hills are just too steep to actually to actually run machines on. So Unfortunately, you know, like in areas in, in the uh, Kamati Port and Malalan, uh, they are already uh, pushing uh, for significant mechanization there already. And uh, they can do it on their flat, their flat land on which they farm. But unfortunately, in KwaZulu-Natal, um, the hills uh, don't allow us to do that. So, I mean, there's not, there's almost in our sugar industry, not like a tipping point where it does actually start to make financial sense for farmers to look at mechanization. It's it's just too expensive. Yes, yes, it's too expensive. And it, and and uh, I, I don't know if the technology has caught up to have flat harvesters or something to mm -hmm. manage the slopes, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's quite, it's not quite there yet. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Richard. Um, Lebohan, we just had one question for you from one of the attendees. I'm asking if there is there any kind of automatic exemption, um, perhaps for smallholder farmers from from the minimum wage. Well, thank you, Nadine. Um, at this present time, there isn't an automatic exemption, so the employer will have to um, make an application on the system to be provided with the exemption. Okay. And then I've just got one more question um, for the panel. I know I'm going to say the word that, that we're not allowed to say in South African agriculture, but is there, should there be a subsidy for, for farm worker wages, especially if we look at emerging farmers and smallholder farmers? And um, it, is it affordable? Is it an option that anybody is, is considering or pitching to government? Or is it something that's just not spoken of? Christo, if you want to respond. <laughs> now, uh, Denine, uh, indeed, uh, I mean, all of us would welcome some form of subsidy because if you look at the, uh, uh, what the American farmers and European farmers, what they receive in terms of subsidy, uh, it, it renders us uh, to a large extent uncompetitive. But uh, despite all of these assistance that's been given to farmers out there, our farmers still remain uh, very, very competitive. Uh, but that's not due to uh, subsidies by government. Uh, and that's due to the fact that our farmers are just very good at what they are doing. Uh, the big question is whether the government has money to, or to subsidize the farming sector. And at this point in time, we've seen the troubles at Land Bank, we've seen the troubles in, uh, you know, in government itself. They've got many, many fiscal challenges. So we can't even, we can dream about it, but uh, it will never become a reality. And that I am certain about. What we will have to look at is uh, coming up with alternatives, uh, maybe uh, private-public partnerships uh, to um, ensure the long-term financial sustainability of the farming sector. And we're looking uh, in depth at, at, at those uh, alternatives. And then secondly, uh, you know, looking at uh, how do we, uh, at the local level, uh, support each other? I'm a firm believer in uh, building the capacity uh, and the networks at the local level, especially local farmer unions, because they may be not, uh, you know, subsidies in terms of rands and cents, but there's a knowledge base and a, uh, you know, a, a, a different type of bond that exists that uh, if you open that up and you strengthen that, it can uh, be of great um, value to uh, farmers at local level. Okay. Thanks, Christian. Thanks to everyone else. We, we don't have any other questions right now. We had a lot of the attendees asking if we will make the, the presentations available. 
and so we will certainly make a recording available and um, and also um, liaise with our presenters to to make those presentations available and we will send out a link to those to everyone who attended this webinar. Uh, I see Dr. Kuis is back online if you want to maybe make some final, yeah, final comments. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you were asking uh, whether government should spend money on subsidizing mm -hmm. wages or whatever. I think where government should spend the, mon the money is to make to take uh, to increase the infrastructure and service delivery to agriculture. And that will improve agricultural profitability immensely. I've on some of the roads last week, and I must say it's terrible. So the, if they inc spend that money to increase the improve the infrastructure and service delivery, then that will help the farmers. And that will be better than a subsidy. I don't like subsidies. Uh, it uh, creates inefficiencies. Thanks for that. Um, yes, I'm going to stop there. I know that, Christa, you've got another meeting to get to. And um, thanks for interesting presentations. I learned a lot and I think, and I believe it was very valuable to everyone who attended. And again, so to Chris, to Richard Lebuchan and um, Dr. Kutsia, thank you so much for, for your presentations and for the time it took to prepare them. And um, to everyone at AgriSA, Chris, to your team and, and Tia, I know Eloise is not there today, but in her absence, um, thank you for supporting Farmers Weekly and in putting this webinar together in a very short space of time. And yes, Richard, we do certainly look forward to to, to working with you at SAK and Growers more in the future as, as with AgriSA. Always a pleasure and also thank you for giving us the opportunity to collaborate with you and thank you to the staff. Uh, they are superstars indeed. Thank you, Dr. Kurs and Richard. And it was absolutely brilliant. Mm, thank you. Okay, that's goodbye from me. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Goodbye.